Let's close our eyes for prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you tonight. We bless your name for the Bible study. We're asking, Lord, tonight, you bless your people in Jesus' name. We pray that every word that comes out, every verse that comes out, will penetrate every heart, every life in Jesus' name. Let wonders follow the word. Let healing follow the word. Let deliverance follow the word. And let miracles attend to the message. Bless everyone here. And bless everyone listening everywhere. Confirm the word in every life in Jesus' name. I thank you because I know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Ocean State can give me a greater amen. God bless you. You can sit down. We're coming to Jude chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 22 all through to verse 25. 22, 23, 24, and 25. And on some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. 18, even the garment spotted by the flesh, now unto him that is able to do, to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory, with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion, and power, both now and ever. Amen. As you look at those verses I've read to you, you see something very clearly. We're talking about God. We're talking about Jesus Christ as Savior. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. We're talking about what Christ can do in your life. And you look at verse 24. It says, Now, Unto him that is able. Tonight, our God is able. In your life, our God is able. Against your problem, our God is able. Against all the infirmities of your life, our God is able. You will see the ability and the authority and the anointing of the Lord tonight. It will roll away all your problems in Jesus' name. Now, the verses I've read to you they give us the conclusion of the whole epistle. It's a very brief epistle. And yet, look at this. It talks about God the Father. It talks about God the Son. It talks about God the Holy Spirit. I'm reading from verse 1, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father. He reveals God the Father to us. And then he goes on to say that we're preserved in Christ, in Jesus Christ and called. As he talks about God the Creator. He talks about Christ the Redeemer. Look at verse 20. And he says, But ye beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. He talks about the Holy Ghost, a comforter. The Father, the Creator, the Son, the Savior, and then the Holy Ghost, it talks about Him, is a comforter. He will help you today. And the epistle reveals, number one, that we're saved. Number two, that we're sanctified. Number three, that we're infilled, indwelt, baptized, immersed in the Holy Ghost. Look at what he tells us in verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, of the salvation available to everyone, salvation available to you, salvation available to me, salvation available to everyone here. It says, I'm writing to you, I'm speaking to you, I'm preaching to you of that salvation common to everyone. It will get to you today. I said it will get to you today. As it talks about salvation, it talks about sanctification. Come back to verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and brother of James, 
to them that are sanctified by God the Father. It tells us there's an experience called salvation. And then it tells us there's a second work of grace. That the grace of God comes to you. Not only that you are saved, that you are forgiven, it sets you apart. It makes you holy. It purifies you. It sanctifies you. And then it talks about the Holy Ghost. That it comes in your life. Number one, you are pardoned by the Lord. That's salvation. Number two, you are purified by the Lord. That's sanctification. And now it says, you can pray in the Holy Ghost. You are filled with the Spirit. You are saturated by the Spirit. You are immersed in the Spirit. You are baptized in the Spirit. And then, you are not just praying with your understanding. Look at verse 20. It says, and ye... Beloved, God will make you a beloved child of God. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, interceding in the Holy Ghost. Then he talks about what we receive. The Father blessing us, the Son blessing us, and the Holy Ghost imparting life unto us. And he talks about the mercy and the peace, as well as the love. Come to verse 2. It says... In verse 2, I'm reading Jude verse 2. It says, Mercy unto you. The mercy of God will come to you. The mercy that forgives, the mercy that transforms life, and the mercy that changes negative things and positive in your life. It says, Mercy is coming. Somebody is a candidate for the mercy of God tonight. Why are you there? It says in verse 2, Mercy and peace. He gives us peace when he pardons us. The sinner has no peace. There is no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. But here we come. And we come to the Lord and the blood of Jesus Christ. His only begotten son cleanses us, washes us. And because of that, all sins taken away. The guilt taken away. The condemnation taken away. And it says, peace unto you. And love be multiplied. You see that? The mercy of God. The peace we get from God. And the love we have from God. For God so loved the world. That he gave his son the begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him will not perish. I will not perish. I said I will not perish. You will not perish in Jesus name. And now he talks about that love. Whosoever. And you are that whosoever. That love is reaching you tonight. That love is turning your life around tonight. The mercy of God, the peace of God, and the love of God be multiplied unto you. And then the peace is talking about, number one, grace. Number two, godliness. Number three, it's talking about the glory of God. It says, we can have the grace of God. And it is that grace of God that brings salvation unto us. But it says, don't misrepresent that grace. Don't misunderstand that grace. And it says, don't destroy that grace. Look at verse 4. It says, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were ordained for danger of old to this condemnation on godly men turning the grace of our god unto lasciviousness they misunderstand the grace of god but the epistle is here to tell us that grace is available it's also telling us apart from grace there's godliness and then it goes on to tell us there is glory god will bring abundant grace in your life godliness in your life and glory to your life in Jesus' name. Look at verse 24 here. In verse 24, now unto him that is able, able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory. Then he says, with exceeding joy. You know, as uh, this epistle is, uh, is very brief, and yet he's talking about a lot of things. This episode talks about believers on the one hand. And it talks about backsliders on the other hand. And it wants us to make a choice that I will be a believer. 
I will remain a believer because they are backsliders too. It tells us in verse in verse five. It says, "I will therefore put ye in remembrance, though ye first knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people, those are believers. When you are saved, you become a believer." When your sins are forgiven, you become a believer. When you have eternal life, you become a believer. And it says, I want to remind you that he saved the people. And when they became born again, they became beloved. Look at verse 3, the first word there, beloved. Look at verse 17, talking about the believers in verse 17. But beloved, remember. It tells us there are believers. Then it says there are backsliders. I'm coming back to verse 5. How does the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, have to watch, destroyed them that believed not? Those people, they believed for a while. After that, then they went back. They believed not. And they perished in the wilderness. I will not perish. Somebody there say, I will not perish. You believe on the Lord. You become a beloved child of God. A beloved son of God. A beloved daughter of God. And then you keep on and on and on. If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And because there are sinners, and because there are backsliders, the piece is talking about judgment. It says, there is judgment to come. And it tells us in verses 6 and 7. Look at verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but they left their own habitation. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of that great day. It says judgment is coming. And if you want to escape judgment, that's why it says, I'm writing to you of the common salvation, of the salvation available for you, of the salvation you can have today, and the salvation can keep to the very end because a day of judgment is coming. Look at verse 14. And Enoch also, the servant from Adam, prophesied of this saying, Behold, the Lord cometh, with ten thousands of his saints to so execute judgment upon all. A day of judgment is coming. Who are the people that will be judged? You tell us they are rebels and reprobates. So the piece is talking about believers, those who are righteous, believers, those who are redeemed. Believers, those who are reconciled with God. Believers, those who are restored into the grace of God. It's also talking about the rebels and the reprobates. Look at verse 10. It says, but these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things, they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them. For they have gone in the way of Cain, reprobates, rebels. And they have run greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. Reprobates, rebels. And they have perished in the gainsaying, in the opposition, in the rebellion, and in the conspiracy of Cory. It talks about those who are ungodly, those who are unfaithful. And those who are unfruitful. He's talking about all this so that you will know. Look at those people. Judgment came upon them. Look at those people. The fire of God came upon them and burnt them up. And he wants you to come to the side of mercy. And to the side of peace. And to the side of love. That's why he's talking about all these people. I said he spoke about the unfaithful and the ungodly. And the unfruitful. I want you to look at uh, verse 12. As you look at verse 12, it says, These are spots in your feast of charity. It says, They feast with you when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water. What a tragedy. 
carried about with winds, trees, whose fruits wither it, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, forming out their own shame, wandering stars they are. And it says to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Look at verse 15. To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their godly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. But now he talks about our steadfastness. He talks about our supplication. And he talks about our spirituality. He says, I've shown you all this so that you'll come out from among them. And Jude is telling us, you can be steadfast. You are going to be steadfast. I said you are going to be steadfast. Jude is telling us, you can make supplication to God. You can pray unto God. And all those negative things of the past, he will roll them away in Jesus' name. And then he says, you can become spiritual. Look at verse 17. I was steadfast and but beloved. Remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember those words and be firm. Remember those words and remain with the Lord. Remember those words and live an uncompromising life. And then he talks about our supplication and prayer in verse 20. But ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying, making supplication, praying, pleading with the Lord, praying, praying or in the Holy Ghost. And then he talks about our spirituality in verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And now he's talking about a soul winning. A soul winning. That is, you become a believer. You will do something that will bring other people into the kingdom. He says on Psalm verse 22, have compassion, making a difference. On some, have compassion. Have compassion those who are perishing in sin. Those who are going astray, you have the light, you have the truth. Have compassion on the ignorant and bring them out of the ignorance of the wilderness of sin. And bring them into the kingdom of God. And then he talks about the second coming of the Lord. That the Lord is coming. And he wants to preserve us until that final day. Verse 24, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present your faultless before the pres his presence, the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Christ is coming. I pray you'll be ready. Somebody there said you will be ready. When Christ comes to take his own people away and when the saints go marching in, I will be there. I said I will be there. And then finally, now he talks about the glory of God in verse 25. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. And our should state people say, Amen. Amen. As we look at the passage we are studying tonight, the final concluding verses of Jude chapter 1. Verses 22 to 25, I'm going to teach you on our preservation in godliness until the final glory. Until the final glory. There's a glory to be revealed. There's a glory that comes when Christ comes and that glory will appear. He comes in the clouds and he comes in his majesty and dominion and power and glory. And he wants you. You have received the grace of God. You are in the kingdom already or you are coming to, king, in the, to the kingdom today. He wants you to remain preserved. He wants you to continue until that final glory. The three things we're talking about. Number one, our dedication to preaching the gospel. 
our dedication to preaching the gospel that you find in verses 22 and 23. Number two, the declaration of our preservation in godliness is declared that God is able, God is mighty, God is powerful. When you get saved and you receive of the grace of God, he brings you to godliness and he wants you to be preserved in that godliness until he comes. The power of God will keep you until the final day. I'm waiting for a good amen. What a wonderful thing it will be that all of us who are here tonight and all the people who join us at the Bible study, that when that time will come, that the Lord will have kept you faithful and fruitful and firm and compromising the Lord. And then on that day, when his glory shall be revealed, I will be there, you will be there. We'll be there together in Jesus' name. The declaration of our preservation in godliness. Point number three, the dominion and the power of our God. Immeasurable, unthinkable, unimaginable. When you think about his dominion, Universal is dominion, mighty is dominion, majestic is dominion, the dominion and the power, unlimited power that's able to roll every mountain away. And thank God you are here tonight. Say, I am here tonight. And tonight will be the night of the power of God moving all mountains away from your life in Jesus' name. The dominion and the power of our God. I'm coming back to point number one. Do you, do you remember point number one? Tell me out loud. Our dedication to the preaching, to preaching the gospel. Let's come back to Jude chapter one. It says, on some have compassion. Making a difference. That's what compassion, that means you have sympathy. That means you look at those who are hungry. They are hungry spiritually. You look at those who are deprived. They are poor. They are deprived. And they do not have the water of life. And you have the water of life. Give them to drink. They do not have the bread of life. They are hungry. They say, how can I be saved? How can I be strengthened in my life? How can I understand the gospel? And it says, have compassion on them. In short, it's saying, be like Jesus Christ. He had compassion on those multitudes of people. And because of that, he witnessed to them. He preached to them. He healed them. He delivered them. We're looking at Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 35 and verse 36. On some have compassion. On some have compassion. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. It says, And Jesus went about all the cities and all the villages, teaching in their synagogues. He'll teach you today. I said, He will teach you today. I'm preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And then it goes on and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Listen to this now. But when he saw the multitudes, when he saw the multitudes, hungry people, thirsty people, sinful people, oppressed people, deprived people, ignorant people, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. That's the word there. Because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. That's why he was preaching to them. That's why he was touching their lives. That's why he's bringing the word to you tonight. Because he has compassion on you. Have compassion on them. You know, if you have the gospel... If you have the truth, and you hold it yourself, you say, I'm a believer. Thank God you are. I know the gospel. Thank God you do. And I'm a child of God. Thank God you are. But then you're not telling your neighbor. You're not showing them the light. You're not showing them this is the way. What key in it? If you have the water 
of life and people are thirsty and you're not giving them the water you have the bread of life and people are hungry and you're not giving them the bread of life you have the good scene the good scene the good scene which mary has chosen and you're holding it yourself how do i let the love of god in you in first john chapter 3 first john chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 17 but whoso has this was good and sees his brother have need and shortens up his bowels of compassion from him you see your brother in need even of material things of physical things and you can you can give them to save their lives to make their lives more comfortable and to make their lives fulfilled and you hold everything to yourself it says how dwelleth the love of god the compassion of god in him how dwelleth the love of god in him share the gospel give out the gospel preach the gospel tell the people how they can be saved and through you through me and through us many will come to know the lord in jesus name Somebody say, say men over there. I'm coming to Jude, verse 22 and verse 23. It says, on some have compassion. The question is, why some? I thought Jesus died for all. I thought salvation is available to everyone. I thought Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Yes, you are right. Let me first of all emphasize that. That the gospel is for everyone. That salvation is for everyone. That Jesus died for everyone. I'm looking at Mark chapter 16 verse 15. Mark chapter 16. And we're reading from verse 15. It says in verse 15... And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to, tell me out loud, every creature. Preach the gospel to every creature. But Jude is saying, Some. Why? Let me show you this. We're looking at, uh, at First Timothy. In First Timothy, I'm reading from chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, salvation for everyone, salvation for you, salvation for me, salvation for your parents, salvation for your children, salvation for the illiterate, and salvation for the educated, salvation for the high, salvation for the low, because except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Look at First Timothy chapter 2, and I'm reading here from verse 3. It says, for this is good. And acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Listen to this, verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved. He wants all men to be saved. He desires all men to be saved. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. But now come to Jude. I'm reading from verse 22, Jude chapter 1 verse 22 on some have compassion and then he says making a difference you know jude has been talking about many kinds of people and he said not everybody will listen not everybody will accept what you are saying and you're not a match to everyone as you look at all the people that Jude has been talking about, you understand. Look at verse 4. Jude chapter 1, verse 5, verse 4. It says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who before were ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. It says, You may not be able to reach such people. Others can reach them. Maybe Paul, the apostle, can talk to them, but you cannot talk to them. Maybe a man like Stephen can talk to them. You cannot talk to them. And maybe somebody like um, uh, somebody like Apollos, who was freak, who was fervent in the spirit, who knew the scriptures very well, as they tried to turn it upside down, said, "No, that's not right. That's the way. That's the way of salvation." But for the common believer. 
for the average believer you may not be able to reach these people that's why he said there are people you can match the people you can talk to the people you can reach on some have compassion and it says making a difference what kind of difference look at jude i'm reading from verse 11. one to them for they have gone in the way of Cain, and they have run giddily after the error of balaam and they have perished in the gate saying of glory he said you know what there are many people who are just like Cain. Even the Almighty God has spoken to them. And he said, the sin offering is lying by the door. Go take it and make your sacrifice. And the man will not answer. God spoke to him and said, where is Abel, your brother? He said, you're asking me about Abel. Am I my brother's keeper? And the people that can reply God like that, he said, they might confuse you if you go to them. Make a difference. Make a difference. There are people that they know nothing. They are ignorant. And when you tell them the gospel, they say, I've been waiting for that. And there are people like the uh, eunuch of Ethiopia that uh, Philip said, do you understand what you read? And the man said, how can I understand except some should guide me? He was not like him. And it was not like Balaam. You know, Balaam, he was riding the ass. And then the ass saw the angel and turned this way. And the Balaam struck that, uh, that ass. And don't turn that way. And Balaam struck that ass. And the ass began to talk and said, Why are you beating me? What have I done? Don't you see what I see? I'm trying to protect your life. And then Balaam spoke back and said, he was not even surprised. He was not even afraid that an ass was speaking to him in the language of man. He said, if I add a sword, I will kill you. And then the Lord opened his eyes and he saw the angel. And the angel said, why are you beating your ass? Were it not for what the ass had done, I would have killed you, and I will spare that ass. And then the man said, an angel was talking to him. Your way is not right. Your way is perverse. Instead of repenting, he said, all right. If you don't want me to go, then I'll go back. He wanted to go. And Jude is saying, you may not be able to talk to people like Balaam. Make a difference between the ordinary sinner and the terrible sinner who is going to argue. Now it says make a difference. There are people like Korah. And Korah was a person in opposition to Moses. And you know Moses, the one that opened the Red Sea. You know Moses, the one that struck the rock and water came out for millions to drink. You know Moses, the one that lifted up the rod like this and then victory came to Joshua. He was a man of prayer, a man of power, a man of grace, a man of godliness, a man of the supernatural. In that generation, there was nobody like Moses. And Moses said, Korah, come. He said, no, I'm not coming. You make yourself a tyrant, a dictator, a ruler over the people. You tell me to come, forget about that. I'm not coming. And Jude is saying, there are people like that, like Korah. They turn and Abiram. And you say, can I talk to you? Me, get out of my sight. Can I share the gospel with you? It says gospel. Do I need the gospel? Come, come and look at this. No, I don't want to see. They close their eyes. They don't want to see. That's why Jude is saying, make a difference. Thank God the average person you see on the street will not be like that. Thank God the people you, you uh, confront, well, many of them will not be like that. But make a difference if you're trying to share the gospel. And somebody is arguing. And he wants to confuse you. And he wants to destroy even the faith you have. Then he says, make a difference. Go to the people you can talk to. There's so many people you can talk to. And leave that Cain alone. And leave that Balaam alone. And leave that Korah alone. We're coming back now. I'm coming back to Jude chapter 1. And I'm looking at verse 23. It says, others save with fear. What about that? Others save with fear. What do you mean by this? You see, the angels came to Sodom. And they told Lord, they said, Tonight, the Lord is going to rain fire upon Sodom and Gomorrah. 
You have anybody there? Very quickly, go and tell them. Go and tell them. Judgment is coming. And God wants you to be saved. And when he got there, they were arguing with him. They were, they were not listening to him. And then the angels laid hold on their hands. You don't have time to waste. You cannot linger. Because danger is coming. That's why it says, go to them, but be conscious that judgment is coming. Go to them, be conscious you don't have too much time. And save them with fear. And it says, pulling them out of the fire. Pulling them out of the fire. You know what that means? It's that Jude is already telling us that the fiery judgment is about to strike. The fiery judgment is about to descend. And the people you are talking to, preach to them, pray for them, but do not be partakers with them because you are pulling them out of the fire. And then it says, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. I want you to look at the word of God as it talks about their garments. And their garments are spotted, and their garments are defiling. It's talking about some kinds of people. Let me show you Second Peter chapter two. Second Peter chapter two. I'm reading here from verse fourteen. Having eyes full of adultery, that cannot cease from sin, beguiling, deceiving, cajoling, turning aside on stable souls. And had they have exercised with covetous practices, because the children, is this when you meet people like that? You want to win them into the light. They want to get you into darkness. You want to win them to righteousness and holiness. And then they are behaving in a particular way. They want to get you into adultery, into fornication, and into defilement, into evil. It says, leave them alone. They are not ready. They are not ready. You are trying to help them and pull them out of the well, out of the dungeon. And they are trying to pull you down into that same well of destruction. That's why it says, yes, evangelize. That's why it says, yes, talk to people. That's why it's saying, go everywhere and knock on their doors and talk to them. But if they want to destroy you and they want to pull you back into evil and into condemnation, it says, make a difference and wait for them until they're ready. I come to point number two now. In point number two, we're talking about the declaration of our preservation in godliness. Come to Jude chapter 1. Are you there? I said, are you there? Are you hearing what I'm saying? The Lord will bless you tonight in Jesus' name. Give me a great, great, Oshobo. Amen. I'm looking at Jude chapter 1 verse 24. It says, now. Everybody say, now. Your blessing is about to descend. Your blessing is about to come. And now it says, now unto him. Unto him that is able. Able to keep you from falling. He will keep you in Jesus' name. And to, put, and to present you for grace. Before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. It's talking about our preservation there. There's, there's a few things I want to look at here before I go to the concluding verse. Number one, him that is able. Think about that. Him that is able. Number two, able to keep you from falling. As you come to the Lord, maybe you think you are not strong. I cannot hold up. I cannot go on resisting all the trials and the temptations. How will I stand? This God we're talking about, as you get saved, and if you are saved already, the Lord will keep you from falling. I thought somebody there will say, Amen. And then he says, number three, and to present you faultless. And to present you faultless. Then he goes on, before the presence of his glory. And then he tells us, with exceeding joy. Your life will become joyful. Your life will become happy. Give me a good day, amen. Let's look at them one by one. I'm looking at verse 24. Now unto him that is able. My God is able. 
I said, my God is able. There's no mountain he cannot move. There's no problem he cannot solve. There's no depravity he cannot remove. There is no sinner he cannot save. And there is no one he cannot satisfy because our God is, tell me, tell me out loud, our God is able tonight. He will show that ability in your life in Jesus' name. Look at uh, Romans chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 21. Romans chapter 4, verse 21. I'm being fully persuaded that what he has promised is able to perform. Our God is able. As he promised to save, is able. As he promised to heal, is able. As he promised to deliver, is able. As he promised to break every yoke in your life, is able. As he promised to keep you from falling until the final day, our God is able. I'm looking at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And I'm reading to you from verse 20. Our God is, tell me. Our God is, tell me out loud. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly. Above all that we ask or seek, according to the power that worketh in us. That power is working here today. Is able to roll all your problems away. He will do it in Jesus' name. We're looking at Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews chapter 2, we're reading from verse 18. Our God is able. Now unto him that is able. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted... He is able to succor them, sustain them, support them, hold them up. He's able to succor them that are tempted. When temptation comes to you, remember our God is able. Our Redeemer is able. Our Savior is able. Our Deliverer is able. Hebrews chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 25. Hebrews chapter 7. Reading from verse 25. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. We're praying for you tonight, and Jesus is praying for you. I said, Jesus is praying for you, making intercession for them. Come back to Jude. In Jude, reading that verse 24 again. And now unto him that is able, able to present, able to keep you from falling. Able to keep you from falling. You know, there are people that think, if I get saved, can I stand? If I get saved, can I be steadfast? If I get saved... Can I live the life of righteousness? The Lord will help you. The Lord will keep you. Because he's able to keep you from falling. He kept those who believed before us. And today his power has not changed. He will keep you from falling. I said he will keep you from falling. John chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 12. John chapter 17 verse 12. Whilst I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. While I was with them, temptation came to them, I kept them. Trials came to them, I kept them. I kept them in thy name. And the same love he had for those disciples, that same love he has for you even now. And then he tells us in verse 13, now... Come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that thou mightest, that they might have my joy fulfilled in them. Look at verse 14. It says, I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. It says, you are not of the world. The paths of darkness in the world will not catch you will not crush you, 
will not destroy you. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. Look at this now. But that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. It will keep you from the evil. Because we are serving a God, a God who is able, a God who is able to keep us from falling. How long will he keep us? Until he comes. Because, come back to Jude chapter 1 verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and then to present your faultless. That's his goal. That's his aim. That's his desire. And that's what he has power to do. That he will keep you from falling and then he will present you faultless. Faultless. How does he do that? You need to understand. We get saved. Our external sins are forgiven. All the things we have done. When you steal, that's external. You take something from somebody. When you drink, that's external. You take that bottle, external, to your mouth. When you smoke, that's external. When you become born again, all those external sins, they're forgiven. It's like the branches of a tree. All the branches of the tree, they're cut off at the point of salvation. And all the fruits there, all the bad things there, they're forgiven and cleared away. But still the root of the tree. The second step now is to uproot that thing. Take it away so that the thing inside you that wants to do evil, the thing inside you that will be attracting all those bad things to life again, the Lord will uproot everything. And every plant, the Heavenly Father has not planted in your life tonight, tonight. He will uproot them in Jesus' name. When God approves that root of sin, that depravity is called sanctification. And it is through that sanctification a holiness experience it preserves you faultless until he comes. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 25. It says, Husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And he gave himself for the church, that he might sanctify it. You see that? He wants to sanctify that ye might sanctify and cleanse it of the washing of water by the word. That ye might present, that's the word, that's the word. That ye might present ye to himself a glorious church, not having spot or equal or any such thing. But that it should be holy and without blemish. Holy without fault. Holy without spot. That's what he does. In fact, he tells us in Revelation chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 4 and verse 5. Revelation chapter 14. And I'm reading here from verse 4. That he'll present us without fault, without blemish, without sin. He's able to do it. The blood of Jesus will wash you whiter than snow, even from tonight in Jesus' name. If you are there, give me a good day. Amen. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 4, it says, These are they which are not defiled with women. And then it says, For they are, for they are virgins and they are virtuous. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruit unto God and to the Lamb. Look at verse 5. And in their mouth was found no guile, no deception. For they are without fault before the throne of God. The Lord saves us by his grace. And the Lord sanctifies us and leads us into godliness. And then he says, he's able to present us faultless. When he comes, the Lord will do it for you. And then it says in that Jude chapter 1 verse 24, it says, Before the presence of his glory, before the presence of his glory, we're waiting for him, we're expecting him. And when he comes, what glory that will be. And then Paul the Apostle tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, here I'm reading from verse 18. 
What the Lord did for Paul, he'll do for you today. Are you there? I said what the Lord did for Paul, he'll do for you today. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 18, it says, And the Lord shall deliver me. Say it for yourself. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. Let me hear you. And will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he tells us when that happens, there will be exceedingly great joy. Great joy. Your life will be a joy. Your family will experience that joy. Your victory will bring that joy. It tells us in First Peter chapter 3, chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 13. First Peter chapter 4 verse 13. But rejoice. Somebody there, rejoice. I said rejoice. In as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye shall be glad also with exceeding joy. You keep standing until that time. You keep serving the Lord until that time. And he will preserve you in godliness until he comes, until the final glory. I come now to point number three. Point number three, we're coming to Jude chapter one. And in verse 25, Jude chapter one. And we're reading from verse 25. It says, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. And everybody said, Look at now, he's talking about the dominion and the power of our God. The God was served, a God of dominion, a God of majesty, a God of glory, a God of power. With him, all things are possible. That power will be manifested in your life even tonight before you go in Jesus' name. He has power to save. He has power to heal. He has power to deliver. He has power to set you free. Those blind eyes will get open. Those limb legs will rise up and walk. The deaf will hear. The dumb will speak. Impossibilities will be possible in your life in Jesus' name. What kind of God is this that we're serving? Number one is the only wise God. The only wise God. We're looking at First Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 17. Always remember that. Whatever happens in your life, take it back to God. Take it back to God. Because the only wise God, he has the wisdom to solve all your problems. He has the wisdom to show you the way. He has the wisdom to unravel and to lose every yoke in your life. That wisdom will operate in your life tonight in Jesus' name. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. Now, unto the king eternal, immortal, and an invisible, the only wise God. You see that? Paul is telling us the same thing that Jude has been saying. That whatever problems you have, he has the wisdom to solve it. It's only wise God. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And now he says, as we look at Jude, and Jude is telling us, number one, to the only wise God. Number two, God our Savior. God our Savior. There's no salvation in any other. That salvation is here tonight. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God is our Savior. Tonight, it will save you in Jesus' name. First Timothy chapter 2. In First Timothy chapter 2, God our Savior. God our Redeemer. God the one that takes us out of the pit of sin. And it brings us to the palace of the king. We're looking at First Timothy chapter 2. 
and verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. God our Savior. He forgives. He cleanses. He washes our sins away. And he says, it is good in his sight. Because it's God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. Thank God, salvation is for you tonight. Forgiveness is for you tonight. The mercy of God is for you tonight. The grace of God will flow into your life tonight. In Jesus' name, whosoever shall call. On the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it says, so will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Then Jude is telling us something. Let's come back. Let's come back now to Jude. And I'm reading here from verse 25. Number one is the only wise God. Number two is the God our Savior. And then it says, be glory. Is the God of glory. And is the Lord of glory. And because of the Lord of glory, glory is coming to your life tonight. Somebody there said, glory is coming to your life tonight. But you know, you must do something. You must do something. You cannot just sit there and cross your leg and fold your hands and just stay there and say, okay, God of glory, where are you? Whatever you want to do, you have something to do. And when you do what he has told you to do, that glory will come into your life. Shame will vanish away. Sorrow will vanish away. I'm waiting for somebody to say amen over there. Calamity will vanish away. And all the suffering will vanish away. Glory is coming to your life tonight in Jesus' name. It's in Psalm 24. Psalm 24, I'm reading from verse 7. Lift up your head, so ye gaze. Be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. You have to do that. It says, you open the door of your heart, the gates of your life. Swing them wide open and say, God of glory, King of glory, Lord of glory, the Father of glory, I'm waiting here. And that's why Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and he opens the door, I will come in to him. Somebody there will open the door to Jesus today. And then he's the king of glory. When he enters in, all shame will go out of your life. He tells us in verse 9, Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even his, he tells us that we should lift up our heads. And he says, uh, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, that this, the king of glory, may come in. Who is this king of glory? Is the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. It's coming to your life today. I said, it's coming to your life today. Open the door and you're coming. You know what, what Jude is saying? Number one, he's the only wise God. Number two, is the God our Savior. Number three, is the King of glory. And then it says, number four, is the God of all majesty. The God of all majesty. It is majesty, what does he do? It is majesty. What does he want to do in your life even tonight? I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down, on the right hand of majesty on high. He sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. After he has done what? After he has purged our sin. And tonight, he will purge your sin. I said he will purge your sin. There is no sin so deep. There is no sin so black. There is no sin so terrible. That the God of glory cannot take away because he specializes in pardoning us. He's the God of love and he purges our sins and he takes everything away. And then he manifests his majesty and glory. He will do it in your life in Jesus' name. Come back here now to Jude 
And I'm reading from chapter 1, verse 25. It says, number one, to the only wise God. Number two, the God, our Savior. Number three, be glory. Number four, and majesty. Number five, and dominion. And dominion. You know what? Jesus Christ, our Lord, has all majesty and glory and dominion. Revelation chapter 1. Verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, Jesus loves you. I said, Jesus loves you. God loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and to his father. To him be glory and majesty and dominion forever and ever. Somebody there said forever and ever. He has dominion. Not only that, come back to Jude. I'm looking at it from verse 25. It says in verse 25, Jude, verse 25, number one, to the only wise God. Number two, the God who is our Savior. Number three, be glory. Number four, be majesty. Number five, be dominion. Number six, tell me. Tell me out loud. Tell me out loud. Power that passes power. Power that will break every yoke. Power that will destroy the works of the devil. Power that will, that will roll all your mountains away. Tonight, there is power. Are you there? I said, are you there? And that power will work in your life in Jesus' name. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 20. Now unto him that's able to do exceeding abundantly, above all that we ask or seek, according to the power that worketh in us. That power will work in your soul, will work in your spirit, will work in your body, will work in your family, will work in your profession will walk in everything surrounding you tonight in jesus name that power will roll your bodies away that power will cleanse your sins away that power will heal your sickness tonight that power will take care of every problem in your life tonight in jesus name that power is now, now is coming your way i said it's coming your way he will save you he will heal you. He will deliver you. Tonight is the night that power will walk in your life in Jesus' name. I'm coming back to Jude verse 25. Jude verse 25. Here it tells us to the only wise God. The God who is our Savior. Be glory and majesty and dominion and power. Tell me the rest both now and ever both now tonight i said now tonight i said now tonight you will manifest that power now and tomorrow and next week and next month and for the rest of your life forever and ever that power will never stop in your life tonight something great is going to start in your life and then that scene will continue. And remember, it says now and ever. Now and ever. Everybody say that now and ever. Tell me out loud now and ever. Salvation now and ever. I said redemption now and ever. I said my healing now and forever. Deliverance now and ever. The supply of all your needs now and ever. It's going to happen. I said it's going to happen. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory 
by Christ Jesus. I thought somebody there would say amen. I'll give you another chance. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Verse 20. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. That amen will be fulfilled in your life. The goodness of God will come into your life. Salvation, there will be an amen to your salvation. Healing, there will be an amen to your healing. Deliverance, there will be an amen to your deliverance. Miracles, there will be an amen to your miracle. Power, there will be an amen to the power that works in you. It will start right now. Where are you? I say, where are you? It's bowed and eyes closed. It's bowed and eyes closed. The goodness of God is about to start in your life. He wants to forgive your sin to start with. He wants to change your life to start with. He wants to bring light to your darkness to start with. Is a God our Savior. God our Savior. He'll forgive you. He will cleanse you. He has glory. He has power. He has dominion. He will turn your life around. And as you bow your head and close your eyes, if you want him to manifest that grace in your life, and to pour in that love in your life, and to save you, and to change your life, to give you forgiveness, redemption, and also to give you the salvation. Wherever you are, you raise up your hand. Raise up your hand. Where are you there? And say, yes, Lord, I'm the candidate for that salvation. I want that forgiveness. I want you to manifest your glory and your grace and take all my shame and take all my punishment and take all my sin. Take everything away. Raise up your hand if you are there. I want that salvation. I want that grace. I want that love of God. I want the glory of God to come into my life. If you are raising up your hand, you will stand up. If you're raising up your hand, you will stand up. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. You're raising up your hand, you will stand up. You say, Lord, here am I. Here am I. Here am I. I want that salvation. I want that redemption. I want that forgiveness. Stand up wherever you are and say, Lord, I believe. You remember it says, it's God our Savior. God our Savior. And he wants everyone to be saved. He wants you to be saved. And you, as you are standing up, open your mouth and talk to the Lord. And say, Lord, I need that salvation now. I need that forgiveness now. Change my life. Let your glory come into my life. Let your grace come into my life. Open the door and the King of glory will come in. Open the door and the King of glory will come in. Say, Lord, I know you are knocking at my door. I know you want to forgive me. I know you want to change my life. I know you want to purge me and preserve me unto your heavenly kingdom. I open the door. Come in, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in to stay. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord. And tell him, I'll not go back into darkness anymore. I'll not go back into evil anymore. I'll not go back into those dirty things anymore. I give my heart to Christ. He is my Savior. He is my Lord. And I know you will preserve me until the final glory. As we're standing up there, raise up your hand. I want to pray with you. Yes, God bless you. Raise up that hand. You're standing up. Raise up that hand. I want to pray with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for our new brothers and sisters. I thank you, Lord, because you have said, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I bring all these brothers and sisters before you. Forgive their sins in Jesus' name. Turn their lives around in Jesus' name. Touch them. Pardon them. And take all the condemnation of their sins away from them in Jesus' name. Have dominion over them. Control over them. Bring your majesty to bear in their lives in Jesus' name. Let your glory, King of glory, let your glory come to them right now in Jesus' name. Confirm that forgiveness. Confirm that salvation. 
and let your grace now uphold them to be steadfast, to be spiritual, and to be single-minded, following you until we see you face to face in glory. Thank you, Lord, for the salvation. Thank you for eternal life. And thank you because they have come into the kingdom, they will remain in the kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Another amen.